We have here today uh, Dr. Chris Fleming from uh, University of Western Sydney, Australia, who has kindly agreed to talk with us about his memories of uh, René Girard and working with Professor René Girard. So let me start off by asking you, uh, uh, Chris, how did you uh, first come across, uh, when, did you, when did you first hear about uh, René Girard? I was doing a research project for someone who was working on Deleuze and Guattari's work and I was told about this uh, so-called tribute to Deleuze and Guattari's work by someone named René Girard. So I read this and realized it was a long way from a tribute. It was the essay Delirium as System, which was this outstanding critique of Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus. And it was a bracing read and a very funny read too. Um, and so I just thought, who is this person? Uh, and that was really where I first came across uh, Renee's work. And uh, after that, pretty soon developed something of an obsession with it. I see. And so how did you then meet him? Or how did you start working with him? And how did you establish contact with him? I was uh, in the early 2000s, I was on an internet forum in anthropology and I was engaged in a pretty heated debate with a few people about issues of origins in anthropology, origin of culture and so on. And he actually wrote to me and said that he appreciated my interventions on the list. And so it was an incredible shock. Uh, and he's very gracious and, and, uh, and very disarming actually and this led to a, a, a long correspondence with him and I wound up at Stanford as a visiting scholar in 2005 I think it was um, where I met the man and and uh, we, we continued a discussion that lasted uh, for many years so yeah that was uh, and it was there's always this pressure when meeting someone I thought what if I meet the guy and he's just He's not nice or he's very arrogant or he's rude. And of course, when I did meet him, um, he was a really outstandingly gracious and lovely human being, actually. And I was uh, deeply relieved. But uh, and a, a man with a, a kind of wicked sense of humour that I had no way of anticipating either. So. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, I mean, there's, there's a number of different, uh, I mean, there's a few things. One was we're sitting at uh, having lunch at Stanford one day and I'd realised that after about an hour of talking, um, he hadn't really said anything. He was just firing questions at me about what I thought about this and what I thought about that. And I thought this is an astonishing situation, this young academic um, from Australia being interviewed by this, uh, you know, distinguished intellectual. And I thought, I want to hear his views about things. But he, there was this kind of humility in him. Uh, and, you know, it's just a genuinely nice guy. I mean, with the sense of humour, I remember that at one point he was being interviewed on the radio and I went with him uh, to the radio station and the, and the radio announcer had announced, said, you know, better known in his native France than he is here in the United States, René Girard. Anyway, after the interview, René said to me, he said, you know, when I'm, in, uh, when I'm in America, I'm better known in France. And when I'm in France, I'm better known in America. He said, wherever I am, I am better known somewhere else. You know, this is, uh, I'm giving him a slightly Italian accent there, but uh, you know, like that was, but that was, uh, for me, characteristic of the man, uh, you know, he's a very funny guy, actually, and a very humble man that uh, belied the kind of intellectual achievements that he'd made at that, at that point. This is the, at the year, during the year that he was, uh, became inducted into the, uh, the Immortals, the L'Academie Française. Uh, so it was, th these are just some of the fond memories I have of him, yeah. When do you start working with him directly? How did, how did your dialogue eventually move to collaboration? He, uh, when I was at Stanford, he'd read part of my, part of the, the book, um, but then he sent me a letter, I can send you in 2008 about the book and expressing his admiration. But it was as a, as a scholar at Stanford that I ended up really getting involved in discussions um, uh, with him. And, and while I was there, and that's where I met Robert Harrison and 
uh, Michel Serre, um, who was staying with the Girards at the time. It was an astonishing experience to be sitting in Girard's lounge room with the, the you know, two immortals of the French Academy. Um, a, a slightly overwhelming experience. Uh, Michel wanted to talk to me about rugby. As an Australian, he was interested in the national rugby team and he as a, as a rugby fan, which was also, and Jules Verne was the other thing that Michel wanted to talk about in relation to Australia. Uh, and very charming to see the, the two of them working together. Could, as you know, they were very close friends, but <laughs> when they're in the room together, I, uh, uh, Michel's book, Ange, had just come out, Angels had, had come out, and uh, Rene said to me, in the presence of, of Michel Say, I said, this is a very good book, you know, it's the only one of Michel's I understand, you know, uh, it's, uh, he protested it was everything else that Michel wrote, Rene said he couldn't work out, of course he, he could, but it was, it's this kind of, this teasing or banter that went on between the two, which was very entertaining. <laughs> very good. Let me ask you, uh, did you also know Martha Girard? No, really. I met Martha, uh, you know, a few times there and um, a wonderful human being, but I, you know, I, not, not really. And most of my interaction with, with Renee was over, uh, was, was via email. Um, but no, I met Martha, uh, you know, I'd met Martha a few times, but yeah, no, yeah. not really. So. All right. Did you manage to talk to Renee about Christianity? Yeah, I did. Um, but a lot of the stuff was, you know, it's very interesting discussions with him about that. One of the ones that was most interesting to me was that I said, to, you know, one day I said to him, you know, you, you write a lot about uh, Christianity, but you don't write much about prayer. You don't write much about mystical experience, which seems to be so important. Um, in the tradition of uh, Christian character formation, the Desert Fathers and so on. And his response was characteristically Rene. He just said, I know. Uh, he said, I don't write about everything, um, which was a perfectly fair answer. And you know, one of the things he said to me was like, on the one hand, people accuse me of trying to theorize everything and to you know, systematize everything. And on the other hand, they say, well, you leave certain things out. He said, I'm not a complete theorist. I don't incorporate everything. I write about what I'm interested in, what I think about, but of course it leaves a lot out. Which I thought was a completely reasonable response, of course. Absolutely. Did he have a, any um, significant influence on your personal life? Not on your, your intellectual life, on your personal life? In yeah, look, I yeah I, he really did um so i came across his work in the late stages of my phd and in australia i'm probably better known as a theor as a, the author of a memoir called on drugs well i was a um, very serious drug addict and with with very uh significant mental health issues and so on. And there was something about Girard's work on desire that had a very deep influence on me in relation to facing up to some of these issues. One of the central tenets of his work is that, as you well know, is a kind of general movement against romantic ideas of individuality and, and individual distinction. And I think a lot of those were things that really supplied my own addiction with, their, with its intellectual orientation. Now, of course, you need more than um, a theory of desire to sort out your personal life, but it was something that represented a profound challenge to the way that I was living my life in a way. It took years for that to get fully undermined, um, but that was a serious, a, a very serious existential um, element of his work that was impossible to, uh, bypass. To me, one of the appeals of his work is that this very serious and deep theoretical engagement with the world, which is coupled with um, an element that has very serious existential implications for how one is to live. And uh, it was, you know, that, that combination of the works, it's, it's, for me, was very hard to uh, ignore. But I, personally speaking, I felt that uh, that came from the Christian side. 
Yeah, look, I think it's absolutely right. Look, I was raised a, I was raised Catholic and I, I don't think it was until Gerard's work that I thought that any of these things really made sense. Um, I had no way of comprehending what any of these stories were apart from supernatural myths that sounded very similar to a whole lot of other myths that you come across in classical mythology. And it was Girard's work actually that allowed me to make sense of these in a way that weren't just kind of plausible metaphysical tales, but had something very essential in terms of their wisdom or their approach to human life. They were anthropological tales, as he'd put it. They were um, forms of wisdom literature, you might say. And that to me, needless to say, was astonishing. Just the, the shock of looking at how these stories um, uh, possessed, the, the kind of sense that they possessed was a really big uh, moment for me. Um, for, so yeah, absolutely, unquestionably, that was a big element of looking at it. Do you know Jean Ourlan's work at all? Yes, I do. Um, and so one of the uh, one of the early tasks was to have a look at some of the. I mean, of course, he wrote about drug addiction uh, in one of his is. I think it was his first book, as far as I'm aware. And then, yes, the Puppet of Desire was another huge um, text at the time and a profound challenge to the psychoanalytic establishment that was very much uh, still in the air and you know is still is still around. Uh, I've come to like Martha Reinecke I've come to appreciate psychoanalysis more the older I've gotten not seen them as uh, psychoanalysis and mimetic theory is necessarily in conflict at all points but it was a, a much needed cleanser palate cleanser at the time to come across uh, Okulian's work and uh, Girard's work at the same time that that incredible dialogue that they have with Le Fault in uh, things hidden since the foundation of the world. Yeah, right. So what's your favorite book of your art, if I may ask? I think it is things hidden since the foundation of the world. There's very, uh, the, the mounting intellectual excitement that I got reading that book. I mean, for a start, I was stunned by the title. Who's gonna call their book that? Um, in, in the contemporary, uh, you know, French intellectual climate, it was just the most outrageous title I could think of. Um, and this, you know, this dialectic that goes on between the three of them, where occasionally one of them saying to Renee, you know, you can't possibly be saying this. And Renee, of course, says, yes, I am. And it was Gerard at his combative best. You also see it in the Diacritics interview, where he's wanting to, uh, he's, He's got this energy for taking up debates in the academy, of course, interlocutors like Levi Strauss and, and Freud, but also taking on, you know, Heidegger, Lacan, um, Foucault, even uh, all in the in this in this book. And it's uh, it was an amazing experience for me, um, a kind of sense of mounting excitement as I read that book and. Um, that to me is still really uh, the you know the the major text for me, not just because of its content, but its format is something that I just you know really loved, and um, yeah, it's a huge huge experience for me reading that book. What do you what do you think of um, uh, evolution and conversion? I thought that was a very good book. Look, it's fantastic, and it's a very you know, and and there's. Yeah, it's a that's a beautiful book and similar in its format, um, that interview format. Uh, Girard was very, very good on his feet um, in, in a way that a lot of uh, intellectuals I don't think are. Um, they're better in the, the, the monograph form. Girard was, of course, very good in that form, but often his thought was uh, most alive in these dialogues and exchanges. And I think that it's one of the reasons why we end up with so many, you know, a significant proportion of his work is in the form of dialogues and, and, and various kinds of discussions. He was very good at that form of discourse, which of course goes right back to the, the um, conference, the Symposium Disorder and Order that was at Stanford in the mid eighties. Right. And you see the kinds of discussions that go on there all amazingly transcribed in that volume. And you get a sense of someone who is who appreciates the challenge and is very good in intellectual discussion. What did you think of his last book? The uh, Battling to the End? Yes. 
Yeah, I enjoy, I enjoyed it. I felt, in a sense, um, there are some problems with it. I think ultimately, I've got more faith in politics than Girard did as a uh, mechanism of deferral um, of violence. And I think his energy to play Clausewitz off against Hegel. Uh, to make Clausewitz the master of, of theory and of the understanding of history, and Hegel is this 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 kind of idealist in a in a uh, in a very particular sense of that term, um, isn't convincing to me. But on the way, there's some remarkable points, and and it's and for me, it's a very interesting book too because it's a substantial engagement with history in a way that many of his books weren't. And he's a trained as a historian. So it's something I really appreciate, even if I don't ultimately buy his strategy of playing a certain version of Hegel off against Clausewitz. I think that he was a thinker that lived under the shadow of the Second World War and of course, nuclear uh, apocalypse. And I think that shadowed his thought, but I, I think personally I have, I have more faith in politics and as a, as a deferral mechanism where he thinks one always got the sense late in his career that he thought political processes were useless in a way. And it's not an opinion I share. Right. Will you be attending the cover meeting? Uh, the next one that's coming up? Yeah. I'd like to, but the whole world's in, in chaos, isn't it? And it's, uh, we've also had our, funding withdrawn now travel funding I'd love to get over there but whether I'll be able to whether pragmatically I'll be able to get there and whether I'll be able to afford to get there without any funding I don't know but it, it's you know one of the very few conferences that I really enjoy um, it's a real testament actually to Girard's work that the the feeling or the energy of those conferences is just so singular in my experience, the kinds of conferences that are out there. I think the Generative Anthropology Conference is, is smaller, but it has a similar collegial uh, energy to it. But the cover conference is a really beautiful experience and, and seeing old friends and um, yeah, it's great. I'd love to get there. Chris, let me ask you if you were to think about it in all these years that you knew Girard, do you have one or two memories that you can, that stands out the most with you? Yeah, I, I think just sitting and, and having lunch with him and, and talking about the world and the way the conversation would flip between the, the, the quality of the bread we were eating uh, through to, you know, the, the First World War and, and to some literary text, the fluidity of the conversation and and the uh, and and Renee's sense of humour, which I was uh, extremely funny and sometimes very very deadpan. It was, um, but yeah, I just think just uh, having lunch with the guy. It's as as but and the kind of experience that that was uh, for me. But yeah, I think some of the things that I told you know the the, the joke about being known elsewhere um, was is something that's really stayed in my head for capturing the his humility and, and the kind of, uh, the caliber of his humor. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, which is often not something that you see, but, but in conferences is, you know, in, in dialogue he's often very, um, very quick. He was very, very witty and very quick in what he. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking your time and to have this conversation with me. Uh, my pleasure. Renee, I greatly appreciate it. And I wish to hope, hope to see you soon. If not, yes. And, Thanks uh, for asking me.